Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ben, but most of you know me as Taboo Conspiracy, and yes, I'm a flat earther. Like most of you who share my flat earth conclusion, I was very reluctant to take on that flat earth name. I mean, who wants to set aside one's indoctrination since childhood and simultaneously be called dumb by family, friends, and colleagues? It's disconcerting, to say the least. But whenever I feel lonesome as a social pariah, I just remember that most of those same Flat Earth deniers still believe that office fires caused this 52-story office building to collapse symmetrically at freefall speed. And that's just stupid. Most Flat Earth deniers still think that this ridiculous contraption made of curtain rods, poor paneling, tar paper, scotch tape, gold tinfoil, and silly-looking space art is actually a real spaceship from 1969 that could travel over five times the speed of sound. That's pretty stupid. Most Flat Earth deniers still believe that the sun is zooming through space at 514,000 miles per hour while all the so-called planets chase after the sun while maintaining their flat orbital planes around the sun and somehow never fall behind the sun that's traveling 670 times the speed of sound. That's stupid. Many flat earth deniers believe in government lockdowns, wearing muzzles, experimental gene therapy injections, medical tyranny and censorship, transgendering children, scary Russians, drinking fluoride, and every other new thing that the controlled media tells them. I've never considered swallowing and parroting mainstream narratives a virtue. When insanity is the norm, I'm really not embarrassed to take the position of the reasonable skeptic. For those who don't know me, I diligently studied flat earth and globe skepticism for more than nine months before I humbly became a flat earther around April 2016 when I filmed my wife on the other side of this reservoir when the top of the mirror should have been hidden eight feet below the Earth's bulge. And that changed my life forever. From there, I began a series of flat Earth tests at different locations and times of the year. Despite how much it hurt my pride and how much it rocked my worldview, there was no denying it. I had a direct line of sight to my wife in total contradiction to the globe. Flat Earth isn't fantasy, it isn't a religion, it isn't a psyop, it isn't some sort of rebellion against society, and it certainly isn't the cool thing to do, and it isn't some ploy to make money. Flat Earth is our reality. And as for me, I will accept truth, regardless of controlled popular opinions. And maybe that's what separates we Flat Earthers from everyone else. We love truth more than institutionalized conformity. 
And how do I know that Flat Earth isn't some psyop to discredit moon landing skeptics or 9-11 truthers, for example? Because you can test Flat Earth yourself. You don't have to trust me or anyone else. The CIA doesn't have control of your telescope and high zoom camera. The Illuminati didn't enable my P900 camera to magically see around the curvature. The Freemasons didn't cause the curvature to disappear from high altitude balloons. Unlike the globe propagandists, we want you to test flat earth. We want you to think for yourself. I've shared many of my personal flat earth proofs on my channel. 6.3 miles in no curvature, 7.5 miles in no curvature, 7.5 miles in no curvature, 1.3 miles in no curvature, 18.8 miles in no curvature, according to the Globe Math, 172 feet should have been hidden behind the bulge, 21 miles in zero curvature, under the Globe Math, 223 feet should have been hidden behind the Earth bulge, 7.5 miles in no curvature, 17.6 miles in no curvature, 18.3 miles in zero curvature. Again, you don't need to believe me. You can do these tests yourself, and that's what makes Flat Earth so awesome. There are hundreds of these tests now from everywhere. But even with all of the evidence, I'm just not sure how to break through to the stalwart but honest supporters of globe orthodoxy anymore. Of course, this presentation isn't for the many lying sellout globe propagandists who troll these videos. This video is for those remaining reasonable supporters of globe orthodoxy who genuinely still believe in the globe and NASA. Despite all of the growing evidence we have shown of our flat and stationary Earth, apparently, from your point of view, we flat earthers must still be really confused. We certainly have had the same education as you, but somehow you still think you're much smarter or that we flat earthers are just ignorant or something. So, for purposes of this presentation, I'm not going to try to convince you of the Flat Earth based on the multitude of evidence. Instead, I'm asking you to prove the globe. This is an appeal for your help. I'm hoping that you have enough concern for your fellow man that you're willing to put in the effort to save millions of Flat Earthers from our supposed lunacy. If the globe were real... Indisputably destroying Flat Earth with logic, reason, and repeatable and objective and relevant experimentation should be a very simple task. At least that's what I thought six years ago. Well, was I wrong? I've come up with ten reasonable steps to save a Flat Earther. Step 1. Prove the moon landings actually occurred. If you can prove the Apollo moon landings actually occurred, that's the end of Flat Earth. On the other hand, if they lied about the moon landings, then you must reasonably admit that they could lie about anything, including the shape of the Earth. It's pretty simple. If they lied about the moon landings, which they most certainly did, then any thinking, objective, reasonable person should be highly skeptical of all claims related to space, NASA, and all of their subsidiaries, and that's why I think the moon landings are a good place for you to start in your quest to save a flat earther. In one month's time, it will be the 50-year anniversary since man was allegedly last on the moon. Can you believe that? 50 years, never repeated, and people still believe in that nonsense. At the very least, can't we agree that 50 years without repetition makes the Apollo missions pretty suspect? Oh, I forgot. NASA destroyed that technology. I'd go to the moon in a nanosecond. Uh, the problem is we don't have the technology to do that anymore. We used to, but we uh, destroyed that technology, and uh, it's a painful process to build it back again. How dumb do you have to be to believe that? But here's a picture of the actual lunar lander from Apollo 11. This supposed advanced spaceship, which was never even allegedly flown on Earth, looks like a ridiculously constructed movie prop, and yet it supposedly achieved speeds of 4,000 miles per hour on descent and ascent, left no blast crater with a 10,000 pound thruster, and could sustain life for up to three days on the moon in the worst environment imaginable 
while undergoing multiple repressurizations, and it even had enough room to throw in a fold-up dune buggy on later flights. Does that really look like it can fly 4,000 miles per hour? I guess you see an advanced spaceship while we flat earthers see a ridiculous homeless tweaker shelter surrounded by outdated 1960s graphics that look ridiculous. But there's so much more to the fakery. For example, you can see the wires on the astronauts, and people still believe in this. Just open your eyes and look at the obvious movie backdrop lines that you can see everywhere in the Apollo photos and videos. Just look at the vertical backdrop right behind the wire dangling astronauts. 50 years since man was last on the moon. Astronauts dangling from wires. Movie backdrops and silly looking movie props. That pretty much ends the Apollo foolishness for me. And I would think any rational person would agree. Of course, truly independent verification of the moon landings will never happen. And so I guess we're left to trusting wire dangling astronauts. Maybe you think astronauts are trustworthy since they are constantly venerated in the media. Just watch as these astronauts totally contradict themselves when faced with the simple question of what the stars look like from space. You can see the stars. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, and uh, pretty much all the time you can see yeah, the stars. Yeah. It's, it's not a black cool void. Thing. I mean, it's black, but there's all kinds of little polka dots. There's all, the, there's all the stars there. And the cool thing is about it, you can see it during the day. When you looked up at the sky, could you actually see the stars and the solar corona in spite of the glare? We were never able to see stars from the lunar surface or on the daylight side of the moon by eye without looking through the optics. Uh, I don't recall during the period of time that we were photographing the solar corona what, uh, what stars we could see. I don't remember seeing any. The sky is uh, deep black uh, when viewed from the moon, as it is when viewed from uh, cislunar space, the space between the Earth and the moon. And when you're, when you're in space and you're looking into deep space and you're on the sun side of the orbit, uh, the sunlight washes out all the starlight, so you can't see any stars, just like here on Earth. But then when you look out into deep space away from the sun, it's the darkest black you can imagine. And uh, I live in Colorado, and you get up on a clear night in Colorado up in the mountains where there's no light, and you can see all these stars. Well, multiply that by a thousand. That's what it's like in space. And we cannot see stars. The sky, of course, was uh, was black, but it uh, had sort of a velvet sheen. But then you had this black sky, a sky blacker than black, as the old Vid Viticon expression used to be. In like, just hanging there in a vast sea of darkness, in the most frightening darkness that you could ever imagine. I've often tried to explain the difference between darkness, when you turn out the lights and it's dark in here, or blackness. Blackness is the endlessness of it all. It's hard to comprehend. And we have to realize that in space, without the intervening atmosphere, <coughs> The heavens are ten times as bright, stars ten times as numerous. You can see the stars. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, and and uh, pretty much all the time you can see yeah, the stars. Yeah. It's, it's not a black cool void. Thing. I mean, it's black, but there's all kinds of little polka dots. There's all the, there's all the stars there. And the cool thing is about it, you can see it during the day. Uh, the sunlight washes out all the starlight, so you can't see any stars, just like here on Earth. The sky is uh, a deep black uh, when viewed from the moon, as it is when viewed from uh, cislunar space, the space between the Earth and the moon. Now, for some strange reason, we flat earthers don't believe those liars. Hmm. I wonder why. Step two, prove the Earth actually curves away from you at 8 inches per mile squared. Under the globe model, with a, an alleged radius of 3,959 miles, all bodies of water should necessarily curve away from you at approximately 8 inches per mile squared. At just 30 miles, that's a 600-foot drop. We have cameras with telescopic lenses that easily film 30 miles. That amount of curvature should be easy to measure and detect especially with modern equipment. Mere common sense tells you that amount of bendy water is impossible, and that's why the globe propagandists will do everything to evade and deceive you regarding the damning 8 inches per mile squared mathematical truth. And before you cite some stupid propagandist who will claim that 8 inches per mile squared is the formula of a parabola, let me be clear, we all know it's a formula for a parabola, but we're talking about the drop at ground level on one-fourth of a circle which closely approximates a parabola. Under the globe model, the simple to understand 8 inches per mile squared formula is highly accurate, up to even a thousand miles, and that is proven by multiple calculators online and even engineering software which cannot reasonably be disputed. I'm sorry, but you can't argue with AutoCAD. So, if you want to save a flat earther, you must first stand at the edge of a still body of water and prove that the water at your feet is bending downwards away from you at 8 inches per mile squared. Are you willing to take up that challenge? That was my first flat earth challenge to see it with my own eyes. 
This is just one of my tests at 17 and a half miles. At that distance, with a laser height of only 3 feet, I would have to be 158 feet above the water to see the source of the laser over the Earth's alleged bulge. But I'm only approximately 3 feet above the water. To be clear, I am looking at the source of the laser as you can see its intensity. Otherwise, it would not be visible. Go out and test that yourself at 17 miles if you don't understand what I mean. There is absolutely no Earth curvature, and I can give you 100 examples proving the same. But here's a very good way to end the debate immediately. Get on an airplane and watch the gyroscopic attitude indicator. Gyroscopes are designed to maintain rigidity in space, and therefore within a few minutes, the artificial horizon on the attitude indicator should start rising, despite straight and level flight. Prove the globe Earth with a simple but high precision mechanical gyroscopic attitude indicator that cannot be reasonably manipulated by either side. A pilot is, uh, is flying around the curve of the Earth, then it sh he should be dipping the nose down um, every, every five minutes, he should be dipping the nose down to, to stay around the curve. But the thing that really um, uh, got me interested was, as you say, the gyroscope. In, in a plane, there is a, um, an artificial horizon, okay, and it's based on a gyroscope. And if you spin a gyroscope um, on a surface, it will want to stay upright. You can twist and tilt the surface as much as you like, the gyroscope will stay upright. So, if a plane has a gyroscope and it starts um, following the curve of the Earth, mm. the gyroscope would stay upright, which mm. means your, the uh, um, artificial horizon will start to, to roll backwards. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't. Mm -hmm. That's absolute proof that a plane flies over a flat surface rather than a curved one. With several video tests backing our claims, flat earthers say the gyroscope won't show any evidence of curvature or axial rotation. Prove us wrong. Some of the propagandists will claim that the gyroscope has a built-in function to adjust for the curvature and the rotation of the Earth. Think about that. The complexity of a correction mechanism in a gyroscope to account for the curvature in the Earth's 1,000 mile per hour rotation while an airplane is in flight would be impossible. And that would certainly render the gyroscope worthless. But if you still believe that argument, then turn off or remove this alleged correction device. Of course you can't, because such a mechanism doesn't exist. Simply stated, a gyroscope attitude indicator would never work on a sphere and will only work on a flat Earth. That's it. Game over for the globe. Once you understand how it works, the gyroscope ends the debate for the globe. And it ends the debate for the concave Earth as well. But go ahead and test the attitude indicator yourself and see what happens. Step three, measure the distance to the globe's edge. Let's pretend that you have no idea what size the alleged ball Earth is. Could you use simple modern equipment like a telescope or high zoom camera to determine the size of the Earth and simultaneously prove the Earth is a ball? With a little bit of math and a telescope, you can theoretically go out and determine the minimum size of the globe's radius. We simply use the Pythagorean theorem to solve for the minimum distance to the edge of the alleged globe, or what is commonly referred to as the horizon. In our case, we're going to solve for r, or the alleged radius of the ball Earth, using this equation here. Here's a good clear video from Finland, where the cruise ship was 16.8 miles away from the observer with an observation height of 2 feet. The horizon is beyond the ship. We can say that for a fact because... There's another boat, right there, much more distant, that's even higher perspectively. You can clearly see the more distant boat. Although we know the horizon is much further than 16.8 miles, we'll use 17 miles as our minimum distance to the geometric horizon. If we lived on a ball with a geometric edge further than 17 miles at a viewing height of 2 feet, then the globe radius would have to be bigger than 381,000 miles. Do you believe you live on a ball with a radius bigger than 381,000 miles when the Earth is supposed to have a radius of only 3,959 miles? The globe fails the reality test. In this video from Pablo's dog, who is an engineer, with an observation height of 45 feet, the globe horizon would have to be closer than 8.2 miles, but the observable horizon is well beyond the platform that is 14.6 miles away. 
the globe fails the reality test. Here's the test from Dr. John D., who has a PhD. At a viewing height of three and a half feet, the horizon would have to be closer than 2.3 miles, but the evidence shows a visible horizon well beyond 11.2 miles. The globe fails the reality test again. Here's one from California by BMLSB69. Canada by Heath Carmody. Florida by Wide Awake. Washington by Observable Reality. I can give you dozens of these proofs showing that there is no globe geometric horizon as required by the globe. The horizon is a matter of perspective, viewing conditions, and the size of any obstructions. Now it's your turn. When viewing conditions are clear, and the water is very calm, and there is no inferior mirage, go out on a beach and film distant objects that you can find on a map and see if the distance to the observable horizon matches the globe physical model. Step four, prove outer space is real. <laughs> Most everyone believes in the globe and space because they've seen CGI images of Earth from space. But we flat earthers have pointed out the many instances of bubbles in space that prove the footage actually is filmed underwater. Here's some debris that moves with the astronaut's hand, evincing underwater movement. Here's the scuba diver in the reflection of the astronaut's visor. And here is indisputable evidence that green screens are used to fake space at NASA's neutral buoyancy lab. Of course, you have many instances of wire fells on the ISS and numerous CGI mistakes like this one, where the astronaut hands off nothing to the other astronaut, who then sets nothing aside. Or like this one where the color separates from a bag indicating CGI layering. Or this one where the astronaut disappears. But for some nonsensical reason, you still believe. You can't even show us a single picture of the fully assembled ISS in a warehouse where it underwent extensive testing. Not even one test on a fully assembled ISS. Only the truly indoctrinated cannot see the problem there. Some people will claim that the alleged satellite Himawari takes a picture constantly of the Earth from space, but the claim is provably false. They actually take live weather data and wrap it around a ball Earth. You can find the proof through the back door on this NOAA website here. This image alone proves they are faking space. On the right side, they have actual weather data wrapped around a ball Earth, but with no land masses. And on the left, we have one of the alleged finished Himawari photos. And they have the same exact weather pattern wrapped around the ball, but with different lighting and a Terminator line added to the Himawari photo. It's fake. So why would they fake this but to make you believe in outer space? So how can you as a globe supporter prove outer space is real? Of course, you'll never go to space, which alone proves it's nonsense, but you can at least prove that outer space is possible by proving a pressurized atmosphere can exist next to a vacuum without a barrier. We flat earthers say that's impossible, but you can easily prove us wrong with an actual demonstration. Dr. John D. did this test to see if the alleged force of gravity could hold an atmosphere against a weak vacuum above it. And the very weak vacuum, which is nothing compared to space, removed the atmosphere immediately. See if you can repeat Dr. John D.'s test and achieve a different result. Good luck. Step 5. Prove cities can float. When presented with all of the evidence of a flat Earth, the typical propagandist will claim that the long-distance object you're viewing is a mirage. For this photo, the entire Chicago city skyline, except for the very top of the Sears Tower antenna, should have been hidden behind the curvature of the Earth. To explain away this flat Earth phenomenon, this weatherman called the city a mirage. Until I found this photo from Grand Mere State Park. This is from Joshua Nowicki. And what you're seeing here is a mirage. Do you really think that the cameraman doesn't have a direct line of sight to the city, but is instead filming a floating Chicago mirage? That is really dumb. But since you believe in the non-distorted floating city, I want you to prove that an entire city mirage can appear above an actual city that is not inverted or distorted like a superior mirage like you see here. But you would think that a floating city and boat mirages that look exactly like the city and the boat beneath them would be very important to the military. 
Where are the instruction manuals telling sailors and soldiers to not shoot mirages? The silliness of the mirage claim is evident. To support their ridiculous globe claim, propagandists will often point to photos like this one and claim the boat is a mirage floating or looming above the water. But with a modicum of common sense, anyone can debunk this claim, as you can see the mostly hidden but still visible horizon line behind the boat here. You just have to be looking for it. The smooth water is creating a mirror image of the sky above, which creates the illusion of a boat floating, and that's an indisputable fact. So if you really want to prove the Earth is a globe, you're going to have to show me a floating, distant city that's not distorted or inverted that's floating above the line of sight city. Globe propagandists should have hundreds of these floating mirage proofs by now, but they don't have any. Step 6. Prove Antarctica is a continent and not the shoreline of our flat Earth. We flat Earthers primarily believe that Antarctica is not a continent but the shoreline of the known world. Antarctica would be the one place that would prove the Earth is flat or a globe. Is it just a coincidence that no one is allowed to independently travel below the 60th South Parallel since the 1950s? All major countries agreed to the Antarctic Treaty and its enforcement protocols to keep you out of Antarctica under the pretense of protecting the environment. You have to be utterly brain dead not to see the problem there. This is how you can prove the globe. Book a flight for a large group of people, including flat earthers, with lots of cameras that would fly from Buenos Aires, Argentina, to Perth, Australia, directly over the alleged geographic South Pole. Millions of people believe the Earth is flat. Is it too much to ask that NASA sponsor one such non-stop straight-line flight from its $66 million per day budget? These flights should already exist, but they don't. Of course, this flight will not happen, and the globe propagandists will have every dumb excuse to continue the lie. Step 7. Prove axial rotation of 1,000 miles per hour. Strangely, most people don't know that according to the globe model at the equator, you're supposedly rotating at approximately 1,000 miles per hour. You certainly can't feel it, but more importantly, there's no scientific test that you can perform to detect and measure this rotation. There are no air currents resulting from this alleged 1.3 Mach rotation, when there should be a 1,000 mile per hour westerly wind. Here's how you can prove axial rotation. Launch a weather balloon for several hours and see if it drifts a couple thousand miles to the west. If you can get a weather balloon to drift a thousand miles to the west after two hours of flight, then I'll believe in axial rotation. Felix Baumgartner was up in the air for 2.5 hours and should have landed in the Pacific Ocean, but he instead landed the other direction. Maybe you can prove axial rotation by hiring a helicopter to hover in place for five hours and show the 5,000 mile drift to the west. Of course, you have no proof of axial rotation except your misplaced faith in the heliocentric model. That's one silly religion you have. But hey, I'm willing to be proven wrong with an actual, reasonable, and objective test that anyone can perform. Step 8. Demonstrate where curvature or axial rotation is considered by practical, everyday professionals. If the Earth were a globe with a curvature dropping away from you at 8 inches per mile squared, and if the Earth were actually spinning at 1,000 miles per hour at the equator, then those two facts would be vital to all aerospace engineering and weapon guidance systems. It turns out that a flattened stationary Earth is a standard assumption in both the military and NASA, as I am showing here in multiple examples. If the Earth were a spinning globe, no one would ever use flat and stationary Earth assumptions, as that would create inherent and deadly mistakes. In addition to aerospace engineering, plane surveyors, that is your everyday surveyors, never measure or take curvature into account in their work. Aircraft pilots do not continually dip the nose of their aircraft or account for the curvature and axial rotation in any manner. At 2,200 miles per hour, in just five minutes, the SR-71 would have to drop 22,000 feet to maintain the same altitude. Obviously, that never happens. The same goes for submarine pilots. One retired F-16 pilot who says the Earth is flat has come out and revealed how the targeting system of the F-16 is based on a flat Earth. 
Just think about the curvature adjustments that would be necessary for an F-16 traveling at supersonic speeds, intercepting another plane also flying at supersonic speeds. Instead, radar and targeting systems are based on a flat Earth. Snipers, military professionals, submarine pilots, navigators, merchant marines, air traffic controllers, and all, all say they don't account for the curvature and axial rotation. See these videos by Mark Sargent for more information. Again, that should end the argument for the globe. Of course, globe propagandists will claim that geodetic surveyors do account for the curvature, but according to the book, The Principles of Surveying, geodesy is not necessary until a survey covers 1,000 square miles or more. That's ridiculous and would never be used in real-life application. And it turns out that any curvature calculations made in a geodetic survey are simply factored out in the end. So... Show me a genuine professional plane survey that demonstrates a measurable globe curvature. I personally went out with a surveyor to measure the alleged curvature, and there wasn't any. One flat earth surveyor named Ray Goodwin, with 27 years of experience in surveying, has an outstanding $100,000 bet to survey a 60 mile long stretch of beach in Florida. If the earth were a sphere, there should be a 2,400 foot curvature drop at that distance. You want to save a flat earther? Prove it with a real-life survey showing that 2,400-foot drop and win $100,000. A simple and profitable task if the Earth were a ball. Step 9. Prove gravity, mass attracting mass, really exists. When I was a global believer and I began my investigation of the flat Earth, I started with gravity. I searched for actual, repeatable, and demonstrable evidence of Newtonian gravity where mass attracting mass actually exists. I thought it would be well proven, but it wasn't at all. And that truly shocked me. The only actual test they've ever conducted to supposedly prove gravity as mass attracting mass is the Cavendish experiment, and I use the term experiment loosely. According to Cavendish, he was able to take two balls and to measure a small gravitational attraction between them. Cavendish is still cited as the number one proof of gravity, and it's absolutely stupid. If Cavendish was able to evince the alleged gravitational attraction of these two small balls, as the official story claims, then according to the same math, if the moon and sun were aligned during an eclipse, that gravitational attraction on a person would be nearly three million times stronger than the supposed attraction between Cavendish's balls. No one can reasonably claim that wouldn't be measurable in a myriad of ways. Simply put, that means you should be able to detect the position of the sun and moon at all times at your feet, above you, or at your side. You want to save a flat earther? Then show us a device that will detect the direction of the gravitational attraction of the sun and moon at all times with no other inputs. Step 10. Show us the Earth bulge shadow. If the Earth were a globe curving away from you at 8 inches per mile squared as the globe model mandates, then that large Earth bulge should produce a tremendous detectable and visible shadow. But the giant Earth bulge shadow does not exist, and therefore the globe does not exist. For example, in addition to locating enemy submarines, sonar is very accurate in mapping ridges, hills, and trenches of the ocean floor. Despite how detailed sonar mapping is, no one has ever mapped the Earth's curvature with sonar. In addition, as stated by former Navy sonar technicians, the Earth bulge should produce a tremendous shadow that enemy submarines would hide behind. But such sonar Earth curvature shadows do not exist. That is not possible if we lived on a globe. In addition to sonar, radar should also produce a measurable and detectable Earth's curvature shadow that would hide planes. As one air traffic controller put it, he was able to watch airplanes land 350 miles away from his position when they should have been well hidden behind the curvature. So anyway, so I set up, I was perplexed, set my scope to 350 miles, and sure enough, I could see aircraft at 350 miles away, no problem, and I started, you know, we weren't talking about, I didn't know anything about the curved earth, I didn't know about the equation, and I started pulling out my calculator, and, and then I'm sitting there going, well, it's impossible according to these equations, for me to see the Boston traffic. I shouldn't have been able to see it. Others have confirmed the same. 
In other videos, I've discussed the Lorand system that could pinpoint boats a thousand miles away and the German Knickebein VHF targeting system, which was used by the Germans to target buildings in England. Both of these systems should have been severely limited in application due to the large earth bulge shadow. But the earth bulge, strangely, always seems to disappear in application and never produces a shadow. Finally, the earth bulge should produce a shadow that could be witnessed on a daily basis as the angle of the sun supposedly dips below the earth, causing the earth's shadow to simultaneously rise up. But there is no upward earth bulge shadow evincing a sun below the horizon. So if you want to prove there's a globe, this test is really simple. Show us the upward bulge shadow being cast above you on the clouds like this or a tall object shadow rising higher than the object itself, which would both indicate a sun at a lower angle than the horizon. There you have it, your 10-step pathway to save flat earthers.
a deeper meaning you will find Won't you listen to me I want you to see I'm dying to set you free Cause when you open your eyes you realize that there's so much more to be seen Just give me some time to blow your mind I want you to see what I see Give me your hand and hold on tight I'll take you to a place so bright Then you will finally understand this wonderland Won't you listen to me I want you to see I'm dying to set you free Cause when you open your eyes you realize that there's so much more to be seen Just give me some time to blow your mind I want you to see what I see Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and find it useful. Thank you.